Welcome to this, PAG 2.3, identifying the unknown carbonate. Here is a sample of a carbonate. The formula for it is X2CO3. We're going to do a titration to work that out, because carbonates, being basic, they will basically neutralise on the addition of acid. And so this here is going to be our titrant. We're going to make this up in solution to be our analyte. And we are going to observe the end point, the point of neutralisation with methyl orange. The first thing we need to do is make up our standard solution. So first things first, we're going to measure about 1.4 grams Making sure that the scales are in grams. Perfect. So now we're going to make our standard solution. We're going to rinse the powder off the weighing boat into here, making sure that all of it is in there. The next step is we're going to add some water. As so long as it's less than 250 millilitres, that's fine, but we want to see it all dissolve. We're going to stir it until it's all gone. Now we're going to carefully add it to our volumetric flask. And we're going to rinse it in, so we're just going to add a little bit more water because we want to make sure that any undissolved carbonate has gone in too. And again, and we're going to measure it up to 250. And now the fun bit, with a finger on the top, hand on the bottom, we're going to invert it several times just to make sure that that is really well mixed. There we go. We're going to take 25 millilitres of this and now add it to a conical flask to go underneath. So, when it comes to filling up the burette, the very first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to rinse it through with the chemical hydrochloric acid. So I'm going to place a beaker just here, stop the stopcock. I'm just going to add a little bit of hydrochloric acid in here, just in case there has been anything else in here. And then we're going to flush it through like this. This will also get rid of the air bubble, like that. Once it has flushed through, we're then going to measure out an amount of this 0.1 molar hydrochloric acid. It needs to be below the zero point on here so that we can measure the change in volume. So now we shall remove this. And here is our analyte. And we're going to put a few drops of methyl orange in here. Because this is quite dilute, we'll add a few more drops, we've got to six, so that the colour change is really visible. The first run of a titration is usually uh, a preliminary run to get a feel for roughly how much is required. So that on the second run, you can go drop by drop at the amount that is similar to what you discovered on the first run. So let's have a go. Preliminary try over. We're now ready to do our first run. We'll add to this three drops of methyl orange.
give it a swirl. And record our first volume, which on this is 0.60. Let's titrate. And I think with there. So that is twenty twenty seven point five. Titrating a carbonate is booby-trapped. Yes, there is a catch. If you compute these numbers, then you will get, um, for the unknown carbonate, a molar mass of about 1,800. Ten times too big. Where has that come from? Well, it's to do with the fact that when we were adding acid to the unknown carbonate, it was first going um, from neutral to acidic and turning red, but then it was clicking back again. Now, your first thought would be that, okay, something is interfering with the acidity. There is a reaction going on more than neutralisation. So what exactly is that? Well, of course, we know acid plus carbonate produces carbon dioxide, but carbon dioxide is acidic. So you would expect once it goes red, for it to stay red not for it to revert back to alkali. What is going on is there's an intermediate step. Before producing carbon dioxide, it's producing, um, imagining that the unknown carbonate is sodium, sodium hydrocarbonate, which is alkali. So it means that you have to make sure that you're not measuring the end point as the point where it will no longer revert, which would produce large numbers like this, but the first time the liquid goes entirely red, even if it instantaneously goes back to yellow. So here is our data. You can see that we had quite good concordance, but is it going to actually produce the results. So let's work it through. The very first thing um, to note was that the concentration of the HCl, the hydrochloric acid, in this experiment was 0.1 molar. The, uh, the mass, the sample mass of the unknown carbonate, X2CO3, was equal to 1.4 grams. So the very first thing we need to do is work out how many moles of acid um, we used. So the number of moles of HCl equal to uh, the concentration of the acid multiplied by the volume, the titer, that went through the uh, burette. So that is equal to the concentration of 0.1 multiplied by the volume. But of course, that's in centimetres cubed, and we need this volume in decimetres cubed. So we've got to do the trick of dividing by a thousand. And this comes out at 2.78, rounding up, times 10 to the minus 3 moles. So that is how many uh, moles of hydrochloric acid. Now the moles ratio in this is one to two. So we know that the number of moles of unknown carbonate in our analyte was half of this value. So it's going to be 2.7, 2.7 times 10 to the minus three and divided by two. So the number of moles works out to be uh, 1.39, 1.39 times 10 to the minus 3 moles. The next step is to consider that there was 1.39s in the analyte, in the 25 millilitres. So how much was there in the standard solution, which was 250 millilitres? Well, there'd be 10 times more because there was 10 times more volume. 
So the number of moles in the standard, so just write here, in the standard, the number of moles of the unknown carbonate would be equal to 10 times this, 1.39 times 10 to the minus 2 moles. Now since, uh, if we know the number of moles, or the number of moles is equal to the sample mass divided by the molar mass, we've got the number of moles, and we know what the sample mass was. It was 1.4 grams, that's what we put in at the start. So we can do that the molar mass, or the relative formula mass if you like, is equal to the sample mass which was 1.4 divided by uh, the number of moles, which is 1.39 times 10 to the minus 3. And the answer comes out with this calculation as 100.71 grams. Now when we consider that if that is the total molar mass of this entire carbonate, our carbonate's mass is x times 2, because we don't know that, plus 12 of the carbon plus 16 times 3, that has got to, if that equals 100, 0.71, then x is going to equal 30, give or take. Now when we compare this to the periodic table, 30 places this, uh, car this, um, uh, this group 1 metal as phosphorus, and it's not phosphorus, it's clearly not going to be phosphorus. So what was it? Well, the nearest is sodium, and in fact it was sodium. So sodium, uh, with a relative uh, formula mass, well, a relative atomic mass of 23, if we put that all the way back through our calculation, it means that the titer should have been about 26.5. Uh, now that means that it's only about one centimeter cubed difference to make the difference between whether or not your result tells you it's sodium or whether or not your result tells you it's phosphorus. It's a very small amount. Now, with this experiment, I've run it again and again and found that the particular concentrations that I'm using and the particular amount of mass of the sample that I've measured out always seems to give me this really good um, concordance. So, where must the inaccuracy have come from that is making this uh, a larger value? Well, it could be the sensitivity of the weighing scales, it could be the original concentration of your acid. Uh, you're trusting, of course, that the acid is 0.1 molar. You could, of course, try with a, a range of different acids, uh, some of which you've diluted yourself, to see if that actually makes a substantial difference. But that is how you do the maths for PAG 2.3.